This evening on The Rock Newman Show, the District of Columbia has come a long way from the 1990s when D.C. was named murder capital of the United States with 479 homicides. Tonight, we talk with Peter Newsham, the city's current chief of police, about his vision for the force, engagement with the black community, controversial issues like stop and frisk, and more. That's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to the Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University right here in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. The Metropolitan Police Department's Peter Newsham joined the force in 1989 and quickly rose through the ranks following promotions by two of his predecessors, Chief Charles Ramsey and Chief Kathy Lanier. DC Mayor Muriel Bowser named him Chief of the Metropolitan Police Department in 2017. At a time, the city was inundated with issues directly related to gentrification and growing concerns about police brutality and citizens' rights. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today, Chief. Rock, thanks for having me on. Good to I see you. I appreciate it. All right. Um, I'm going to tell folks something that maybe no one else, else has ever told them because I was at a summer uh, uh, cookout with you down at Bernard Demchek's house and you ate up all the collard greens. <laughs> <laughs> you and Phil, Mil yeah, Phil Mendelssohn. Uh, yeah, when he wasn't reaching on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, again, thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, part of what I like to do here, especially when we have uh, figures who are leaders in the community, whether it be someone on, I, I, I did Jim Vance, you know, and, and part of what I want, always want my viewing audience to understand is not just what you do, but who you are. And so to that end, I, I'd really like to kind of start with a little, a bit of a biography in terms of, you know, where you grew up, okay. where you grew up. Yeah, I grew up in, uh, in Massachusetts. I grew up in a town in Massachusetts called uh, Weymouth, Massachusetts, which is on the south shore uh, of Massachusetts. Um, ended up going to school, um, ended up uh, going to undergraduate at a I'll tell you what, before you get there, because we, we really want to know, man. So <laughs> you want to okay. get into the younger so, age. So, 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 so mom and dad in the house? Big family. Mom, okay. and, da mom and dad were in the house. Uh, I have five sisters and two brothers. Uh -huh. uh, dad worked. Uh, mom worked much harder as a mother, mm -hmm. raising eight children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she's a miraculous woman. Uh, and now she has uh, over 30 grandchildren and nine great grandchildren. How special is that? Yeah, it's awesome. She, yeah. And she, the, the incredible thing about my mom is that, um, you know, Christmas comes around uh, and she can get a gift for everybody in the family and get the exact size, which is, I don't know how the heck she does it. Un unbelievable, <laughs> huh? Yeah. yeah. Um, and as an early, uh, you know, in your early years, what were your fantasies? What were your dreams? What did you want to be when you were, when you were a little boy? You know, I, I, I didn't always envision myself being a police officer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had always kind of told my mom I was going to go to law school, uh -huh. um, which is interesting because I finally did, but I became a police officer first. Uh -huh. I almost did that because I had always told my mom that I wanted to, you know, do, do what I had told <laughs> my mom that I was going to do. Uh -huh. Uh, but the way I ended up getting into policing actually is um, I got my undergraduate degree in political science. Where do all good political science majors go? They go to Washington, D.C., right? <laughs> right. right? Politics, right. Right? right? So I ended up in Washington, D.C. I'd done an internship here actually in college. Be mm -hmm. And the thing about Washington, D.C. is when you're not from Washington, D.C., the thing that struck me when I first came here is what a really beautiful city yeah. Washington, D.C. is. Yeah. It was, just struck me as being a really beautiful city. Yeah. Um, I get down here, I'm looking for jobs up on Capitol Hill. Um, they paid about, I want to say about $13,000 a year. 
uh, the police department paid twenty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars or so mm -hmm. during the police department. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So let me ask you something. So you know, again, uh, we talked about you know early childhood, mom, dad. Um, what were your, who were your early significant influences? Yeah, so, you know, uh, my dad was a big influence uh, for me. He actually uh, started uh, in his job as a bricklayer, mm -hmm. uh, and then he worked his way up. Uh, he didn't get his uh, degree until much later in life. Uh -huh. uh, and when he left, he worked for the power company. Okay. Uh, when he left, he actually left as one of the vice presidents of New England Light and Power. Mm -hmm. He had actually built a couple of power plants because uh, he, he ended up being an electrical engineer. Yeah. Uh, and so that was very influential to me as a child to see, because he started out uh, as a blue collar guy. And yeah. to see a guy uh, do that uh, through his life, uh, it made me always think that I could, I could follow in his shoes and do the same. Uh huh. Yeah. Now, uh, you, eight, you have a family of eight. Five, I do. Five yeah. brothers and? Five sisters and, and two, two brothers. brothers. So, yeah. so, so, so family of eight, where do you fall in the chain? I'm in the middle. Uh -huh. so I'm, I'm the middle boy and I'm the, uh, the fifth child. Uh -huh. So I'm, a, I'm, the, I'm, you know, they, they say that, I, I don't know what they say about middle children, but I was definitely in the middle. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, now, do you, were you, uh, uh, did, were you on a patrol in elementary school? You know, funny you should ask that. I did end up being uh, in my elementary school. I ended up being a, a how did, did you know that? Did somebody tell you that? Absolutely oh, not, really? absolutely not, no. I ended up being like the crossing guard and you got to wear like a little lieutenant's badge as the crossing guard and I was so proud of that. So maybe that's what inspired me. Let uh, me tell you a very <laughs> self-serving reason that I asked that question. is because it gave me an opportunity to be able to say that I was a patrol, and in my elementary school, I was the first person, as was a fifth grader, that ever became captain of the patrol. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice, nice. So I won a badge <laughs> in my career also. Um, so, okay, so you, uh, you, 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 you get to school, mm -hmm. you do your undergrad political science, you, get the, you come here looking for a job on Capitol Hill, you join the police force in 1989. 89, yep. Which was some tough times. Tough times, uh, and it was, um, I, you know, I made the decision to join, not really knowing what I was getting myself into. And I tell people all the time, it was the best decision I made in my life. I, I loved the job from the very first day. I mean, uh, I went into a class with 59 other young people uh, from this region, from other parts of the country. Uh, you develop incredible bond bonds during that training that you do in policing. And then uh, went out into the community. Mm -hmm. I started in the sixth district, okay. which is in our ward seven. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I got promoted to sergeant, I went to the 7th district, which is our Ward 8. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got promoted to lieutenant, I went to the 5th district, which, which is Ward 5. Mm -hmm. And then when I got promoted to captain, I went back to the 6th district, so back over into Ward 7. So I spent the majority of my early career in Wards 5, 6, and 7. And you know, during the 90s, it was a tremendously violent time in our city. Yes. And there were people that really needed the police uh, yeah. to come and to help in those situations. Uh, and I tell people this uh, story all the time, is that Chief Ramsey, you know, came in as the, as the chief in 99. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a captain uh, at the time, not very long. I had just been promoted to captain maybe about a year. Uh, one morning, you know, after I had been in 5, 6, and 7D my whole career, one morning, or no, actually it was in the evening, I got a, a, a page. You know, we had those little pagers at sure. the time. Sure, sure. He said, be in the chief's office at 8 o'clock the next morning. Mm. So as a young captain, I figured it's one of two things. Either I, I'm in really big trouble mm -hmm. <laughs> or something good's going to happen. What have I done now? <laughs> right. So I go in, and the chief's there, and the executive assistant chief, a guy by the name of Mike Fitzgerald, were in the office. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? He says, he says Pete, I'm going to make you the commander of the second district, wow. Wow. which is up in Ward 3. Yeah, yeah. And I was Idaho? Like, Idaho Avenue. Idaho Avenue. Yeah. Very excited, Chief. Yeah. Thank you so much. Of you know, a young yeah. captain. I you know, sure. I, I'm going to do the best for you. And I was like, Where is it? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was not a part of the city. Yeah, that so I had you ever had gone. You yeah. had gone to those <laughs> into that area. I, I had never policed in that part of the city. Uh, and the, so the thing that I learned uh, from that experience is that uh, although policing is different yeah. in Ward Three than it is uh, in a lot of other uh, parts of the city, particularly at that time mm -hmm. uh, in D.C.'s history, 
the people were just as passionate about their police service. Yeah. You know, they wanted the police to be responsive to their concerns. What, what year is that? You know? uh, I went there in 2000. Oh, 2000. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you came on in 89. Uh, the, the, in 1992, D.C., there were several years D.C. was the murder capital. It was. Yep. And I remember we put together, uh, someone had, um, had given out some uh, Adidas shoes or Nike shoes or something like that for turning guns in. There had been several, this I think was the third or fourth year in a row, D.C. was the murder capital. And we put together a little campaign, which was funds for guns. And we ended up doing it over at, uh, in, in Ward 8 there at Willie Wilson's uh, okay. Church, Union Temple yep. Baptist Church. And we went out and I thought, you know, in our wildest dreams, we said, man, we're going to give $100 for everybody that turns in a gun. And we really wanted that to be an example of some leadership and to say, you know, we want to see what we can do in our little small way to have an impact on the community. And so we figured in our wildest dreams that we might get uh, 500 guns. And so obviously we did our calculation, said that's gonna be $50,000. So we wake up that morning and it is a blizzard. It's below, it's maybe 20 degrees, snow coming down, so now we're freaking, oh man, you know, I mean, we're not gonna make much of an impact. We get to the church and there are people wrapped around and by maybe 10 o'clock in the morning, that Fifty thousand dollars was gone, gone. Yeah. and long story short, my wife got in the car with two members from the SWAT team because you know the force to, had to, to take the guns. Folks over there, yeah. you know, and 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 they went back to the bank, got a whole bunch more money. We ended up getting about three thousand, um, uh, three thousand guns off the street that day. That's a lot. Um, you know, we've never been able to, never wanted to take credit, but the homicide went down dramatically in the weeks after that. I've always wondered if that had any <laughs> impact, which leads me to just an issue that there's continues to be a raging debate about. Some of the guys were talking about before we came on the air here, and that is about DC laws and how it relates to and challenges the NRA, the gun control, the lobby group, and the rest, and what the chief's position is on what is sensible gun control. Yeah, so, so you know, uh, guns are driving, uh, illegal guns are driving uh, the violence in our city, and, and there's no question about that. Uh, so around 80% of the homicides that we have in our city are, are by illegal firearms. Uh, illegal, you know, people say, well, what is an illegal firearm? And that's a firearm that's either purchased or possessed uh, that in, in opposition to the current statutes. So it doesn't matter really what state you're in. There's different uh, degrees of what's illegal depending on what state you're in. Mm -hmm. um, I am very comfortable with the laws that we have in the District of Columbia. I truly believed, uh, believe that the laws we have in the District of Columbia have, has saved lives. Um, can can, can yeah. you share with us sort of what they are? I mean, you don't have to get way down in the weeds, but so, sort of so top in, line of what? Where we, the current state of affairs in the District of Columbia is you can possess uh, a re and register a firearm to have in your home. Mm -hmm. You have to go through a process. You can go to our website and it'll lay out all the details for that. And you can also get a carry permit in the District of Columbia. Okay. We only have about, uh, in this city, uh, I want to say about 8,000 carry permits. Uh -huh. uh, and then we have, um, you know, many more registered guns that are in homes. So right. you can legally possess a firearm uh, in the District of Columbia. Uh, it's the illegal guns that are causing the problem. So, mm -hmm. so you asked me where I stand. I, I, I will say this. Um, there is absolutely no need uh, for assault weapons. Uh, in any major city in our country. Mm -hmm. No need for them. You in favor of a ban? Uh, for assault weapons, 100% in favor of a ban. Mm -hmm. uh, assault weapons were designed to uh, kill human beings yeah. in a warfare situation. Yeah. And uh, the capacity of those weapons in a, in a large city, which is so dense with people, yeah. 
uh, they're just too dangerous to have. If you want to have an assault weapon, you shouldn't have it in a major city. So I'm 100% in favor of, of a ban. And, and you see that any of the mass shootings that we have had uh, in our country are almost exclusively involved these assault weapons. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you, you see what happens. You have young children losing their lives, uh, kids going to college, uh, people at uh, synagogues, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, in my mind, I, I, don't, I cannot think of a, of a good reason to have assault weapons. Um, with regards to, uh, you know, in the District of Columbia having very strict rules about uh, carrying a firearm, I think that's important. And that's mm -hmm. important for the district in particular because we have so many dignitaries that mm -hmm. are in our city and come to our city. To have strict rules about having a firearm, I, I'm in favor of that as well. Does that, do you think that that sufficiently answers what you're, what I, you're I asking? Think it's the, yeah. I, I really think it's, uh, it's, it's the top line. So, you know, the... There's often the argument, staying with the guns for a moment, that D.C. has some of the most restrictive laws in the country. Yet the rate of violence uh, 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 perpetrated by those with guns still remains very high. Yeah. How do you fix that? I think that that used to be uh, an argument that somebody could make in the district when we were the murder capital. Mm -hmm. But our violent crime in our city has reduced drastically. Uh, and if you look at the last 10 years, reported violent crime in our city has really dropped dramatically. Mm -hmm. We had a really bad year last year. We had 100, 160 homicides in our city, uh, which is way too many for 67 square miles. So I, I, I'm not so sure that uh, that that is a valid argument mm. that that the restrictive gun laws haven't made a difference because uh, I firmly believe that we need to make sure that we don't allow, allow firearms to get in the hands of the wrong people. Mm. You know, you have people out here who have mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, you have people who have the intent to, to use a weapon illegally. Uh, felons, for example, uh, who want to pick up a firearm. Those, the, the police department, it, it's very beneficial to us to be able to make sure that those firearms are, are re removed from those circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, so with the violence having subsided, um, the trajectory has been down, as you said last year, yeah. you know, you, 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 you had more homicides. What, <clears throat> what is your... What is your fundamental approach and ph basic philosophy about policing? So it took me uh, 30 years of my life, uh, to, and, and I've accumulated this information over those 30 years in policing uh, to, to, to learn one uh, fact about policing that's critically important. Uh, it's really uh, having legitimacy and trust uh, with the community that you serve. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is a very difficult thing to achieve in policing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that requires a, a constant daily effort by mm -hmm. every single person on the police department. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're challenged with right now in policing is you could have one police officer who's a bad actor. Yeah. Uh, their behavior is going to be displayed to everybody. Mm -hmm. So all the work that you've been doing to build bridges, to develop relationships, uh, to, to be transparent and be legitimate can be destroyed by the actions of, of one or two people. Mm -hmm. And so that's, the, I, you know, if you take, talk about frustrating and challenging uh, in this work, that, that's, that can be very painful. That strikes you at your heart. We have a video from your predecessor, uh, Kathy Lanier, just speaking to that point. Let's take a look. All right. Well, I mean, I think it really is the, the community just needs to feel like the department the police department, and I mean individuals in the police department, not just the, the department as a whole, but individuals, they have to feel like that we really, truly, honestly are here to, to make life better for them, that we care. When somebody gets shot in a community, when somebody gets hurt in a community, if they feel like the police really don't care, mm -hmm. they're not going to tell us anything. We have to show them that we care. And that's not that hard to do. Most cops that I talk to and most cops I've known in my entire life, with very small exception, this is what they want to do. They, they live to help make people feel safer and be safer. Mm -hmm. They're not very good at articulating it, mm -hmm. and we don't train them to go out there and make sure people understand that. So I'm trying to train them to understand that. Mm -hmm. That is important when you get on the scene of a crime to not just do it, just the facts, ma'am, yeah. right? I'm so sorry this happened to you. Yeah. 
you know, to be a little compassionate, show some empathy. Um, there's more to policing than just the facts. Yeah. So, to that end, with what uh, Chief Lanier said, who's gone on to great things with the NFL, um, and, and what you said is to develop trust. You acknowledge that's one of the most difficult things to do. Yes. So just yesterday, didn't know we'd be talking about this, but just yesterday uh, reporting, and I think coming out in the Washington Post ye yesterday and today, is the uh, ACLU challenge to the department, to you and your, your, your officers, about the disparate rate of arrest of African Americans throughout the city for what they refer to as minor crimes, small offenses, smoking marijuana yeah. in, in, in public and that sort of thing. And that, you know, sometimes uh, some, of the, some, of the, some of the issues they were in the 80 percentile, something I think was 90, yeah. 90 plus percent African Americans arrested. With those rates of arrest, which indicate a bias. How do you, how do you change that? And how does that become less, what would appear to be less bias? So that, that's, a, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it. So, you know, you look at a report uh, from the ACLU uh, and they use two data points. Uh, the two data points that they use is they use uh, arrests for minor offenses uh, and they use race. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't consider any of the other really important data points that need to be considered. Like what? Uh, for example, uh, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, deployment of police, uh, where is our crime happening in the city? All of those things need to be considered. Uh, and the other thing I think that's uh, critically important uh, for, for folks to think about is that when we have seen uh, as an agency disparate treatment with regards to arrest, we've tried to change behavior to impact that. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to draw some bright line rules uh, from a report uh, that is written um, uh, purposefully, I think, to some degree, to, to espouse a certain, uh, certain point of view mm -hmm. um, with just two data points. Because what happens is when you're talking about minor offenses in our city, uh, minor offenses affect people. You know yeah. what I mean? For example, uh, uh, publicly smoking marijuana, mm -hmm. uh, possession of open container alcohol or drinking in public. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people in our community, uh, and it's folks from all over our city, that call the police and want the police to do something about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that what we're doing as a city now is we're, is we're saying, well, maybe arresting isn't the best thing. One of the things that that report didn't point out is that for those types of offenses that they were talking about, the Metropolitan Police Department has drastically reduced the number of arrests that they make for those category of cases. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that the report didn't point out is like, for example, for public consumption of marijuana, mm -hmm. that we no longer do custodial arrests uh, at MPD. What mm -hmm. we do is we issue what is uh, almost the same as a citation mm -hmm. to folks. And that was, uh, and that switch came when? When, when did you stop that making That just custodial? happened about a year ago. Uh -huh. so, so when we see, uh, and you know, the whole marijuana thing has, is a recent evolution because in, we, we made, um, you know, we decriminalized uh, marijuana here in the district, I right. want to say in 14. Mm -hmm. And then when we saw the numbers on the police department for public consumption uh, seemed to be having a disparate impact, we said, as an agency, we said, well, listen, we, we got to change what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And we started to issue citations. And now that I see this report coming out uh, from uh, the ACLU, the, the no permit offenses are a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, you know, the city has to talk about whether an arrest is the proper circumstance. You certainly can't let somebody drive who doesn't have a driver's license yeah. because that's a safety issue. And you sure. know how many uh, traffic uh, deaths we've had in our city. Uh, when you're talking about possession of an open container of alcohol, if we see that that's having a disparate impact, mm -hmm. maybe we need to think about going to a citation circumstance there mm -hmm. too. And so I guess that the other side of the coin that a lot of people don't consider is the community who calls and says, you know, those, th that group of guys, and it's generally young men, mm -hmm. are out there and they're smoking marijuana 
in an area where, where now I can't access the CVS. You know, an elderly woman will call and I want the police to do something about this. Mm -hmm. And they see the police come up and they'll issue a citation and the police leave. Mm -hmm. And then maybe the activity continues and they're like, well, the, now the police haven't done what I've asked them to do. So it's not, it's not an easy issue. And it really, I think, uh, one of the things that the report did point out uh, particularly when they were talking about the no permits, is some of this is, uh, has to do with, with uh, somebody's ability to, to have income. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, so you, you, can, you can be in a circumstance where, you, where you're in a poor situation where you're unable to get a permit, but you mm -hmm. need to drive because mm -hmm. the one job that you have, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, uh, yeah. is, is driving distance away. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, it's a very, very complicated issue. I think that it's a little disingenuous by the ACLU to say that this is a police and a bias issue. I think that's a little unfair. So they, it, 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 that, and, and that, that, that's the premise of their article. It is, yes. And, and the, the other thing too is they say that, um, they make some assumptions that the fact that there was uh, um, a disproportionate number of arrests for um, no permit, for example, we use an example, mm -hmm. that the police are disproportionately stopping St African Americans right. in our city. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's, that's unfair as well without any data to support it. Do you feel as if, do you feel as if there, in some of those, they're all devoid of bias? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, I'd be naive to, okay. to say that. I mean, come on, right. we live in the real world. Yeah. There's certainly bias, and so I think in, in a leadership position uh, on the police department, my uh, goal is to try and make sure that we don't have bias in any of our interactions. And in terms of training, how do you do that? So, so you, you have, and that's one of the things you have to make your officers aware of is that they do have biases mm -hmm. and every person has biases mm -hmm. it's called implicit bias mm -hmm. and so we provide our officers with implicit bias training so that they know that they have a bias so they can try to avoid it when they're doing their police work mm -hmm. um, i don't know if you're familiar with our um, our training that we have over uh, at the national museum of african american history and culture uh, we started out about Oh, about 14 months ago. Yeah, I mentioned the name earlier, Bernard Demchek. He, yeah, he's, Bernie, he's involved right, in that, yes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Demchek, Dr. Thompson from UDC uh, mm -hmm. teach the class. And this is another thing we have to teach about our officers about, and it helps uh, with an understanding of the police and race relations, not mm -hmm. only in our country, but in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. In the not too distant past, police officers were responsible for enforcing racist laws in our country. Yeah. Uh, and so our community has lived through that. Yeah. And so when they see the police, the mm. first thing that they think of is this, this mm -hmm. is a racist organization. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to teach our police through that program is that, you know, when you, whenever you're dealing with anyone in our community, anywhere in our city, you have to overcome that. And yeah. the way you overcome that is the way you behave. Mm -hmm. And if you, and this is our bottom line. It's really simple uh, for, for policing in Washington, D.C., is that everybody you, you, you interact with under any circumstance, whether they have a mental health issue, whether they have a substance abuse issue, uh, regardless of their circumstance in life, regardless of what they're doing, uh, you treat them with respect. Mm -hmm. Really one word. Mm -hmm. If you treat them with respect, then you will get respect in return. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's our challenge. That's my challenge mm -hmm. uh, as the chief of police. Uh, we have so many men and women in this organization, uh, sworn and civilian, that are working towards that goal. Mm -hmm. We get so frustrated when somebody knocks us back. Yeah. by doing something stupid. I mean, you said one of, you, one, one of your people. One of our people. It doesn't right. even have to be a Metropolitan Police Officer. We just saw yesterday in Texas mm -hmm. uh, a shooting that we're all very uncomfortable with. Oh, man. And people are going to attribute that to all police. Mm -hmm. uh, we're watching a trial unfold up in New York City right now for Eric Garner. Mm -hmm. In that <coughs> case, is an internal uh, New York City Police Department trial that's going on. And yeah. so that's going to impact us here in Washington, D.C. And, and so mm -hmm. what what I ask my folks to do is every single day, come in here, put on your uniform, treat people with respect. Yeah. And I think eventually, I, and I tell you, I travel this city all the time. Pe people, people really like their police department, they do. I mean, we all have issues with the police and we could be better and we're working towards that. 
people like their police officers here in Washington, D.C. I think you know, they're doing a pretty good the job. The training that you're, you, that, that you're talking about, I, I, it's, you know, certainly not to patronize you at all, but it is, that's invaluable. I, I noticed something. When I first started doing the Rock Newman Show six years ago, <clears throat> well, I started over in the southeast on Martin Luther King Avenue at WEAC Radio, but then I took the... Uh, oh, took, you were at WEAC. Yeah, I was oh, at no, WEAC. Yeah, that's right. where we got, that's where the, we, we launched. Um, but we went to Busboys and Poets, and so I was there for several months on a Saturday. And, one of the, and I became very close to the owner, Andy Shalom. And one of the things that I learned from Andy, that I learned about Andy, that what he does, it doesn't matter if it's a manager, a bartender, someone that is uh, sweeping the floor or whatever, but before they start working officially, they have racial, racial sensitivity training. And Busboys and Poets arguably is considered to be one of the most diverse uh, restaurant chains in the metropolitan region. And part of the reason, part of that he's had that success is because there is a sense of comfort for, every, for everyone to come in because everyone is going to be treated the same. And so, again, I give you an opportunity. I, I'm hoping that's your goal. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's our goal every single day, and that, that's what we're working towards is to make sure that uh, people feel comfortable with their police. Okay. You know what I mean? Re re now. Like I said, regardless of their circumstance, uh, if we have to, I tell my officers, if we have to take somebody into custody, and you know that's part of our job, yeah. it's only about 5% of what we do in policing is arrest folks, but when we do have to take somebody into custody, mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be done safely and it needs to be done respectfully. Okay. Respect capital R. That's a that's a that's a big word. We had Council Member uh, Brian Nadu uh, here. Uh, she's Council Member Ward One, which Howard University sits. She had some reaction to the stop and frisk controversy that came up. Let's take a look. A lot of the policies we have in place in government, not just this government, but all governments, really have had a deep and lasting negative impact on our communities of color. Mm -hmm. And that is really what moved me to stand up on this. Um, I work together with a number of groups, um, Stop Police, Terror, um, the Ward 1 Near Act Study Group, mm -hmm. um, and constituents um, who are involved with these organizations. And they've really shown me how I can use my leadership and my privilege mm -hmm. to make a difference in these issues. So. And I'll tell you, this is another area where when you have an uptick in violence in Ward 1, which we do right now, mm -hmm. this is a thing that some people who just don't get it will throw in my face. Right. I'm soft on crime yeah. or um, mm. I don't get it. Now, what's been interesting to me is I feel like all the work I'm doing is sort of building on existing infrastructure, mm. right? We're not cutting the police force, mm. right? We're mm. not doing that. We're, mm. we're enhancing it. Mm. But I'm asking, and my point in this op-ed was, look, the NEAR Act, the Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results Act that the council passed years ago yes, now, yeah. that we're trying to implement this mm -hmm. public health approach to public safety, you know, trauma-based care, um, mm -hmm. intervention rather than, than prison, mm -hmm. um, diversion programs, you know, all of these things that haven't been in place. The big piece of the NEAR Act is the data collection. Mm -hmm. And without the data, on stop and frisk that we we have not been getting all the data mm -hmm. then we can't make informed decisions as a council on how this is being implemented so yeah. my thing was if you're not going to give us the data just stop mm -hmm. just stop altogether mm -hmm. and give us the data we can talk about it so talk to me um, are they getting the data what is the Metropolitan Police Department's position on stop and frisk so I Policy. think, yeah, the, the people really need to understand that we have never had a stop and frisk policy uh, similar to what they had up in New York. Mm. So and the, the one up in New York received a lot of attention and a lot of it's, uh, I think it's really in a lot of people's minds what happened in New York because, mm. you know, the, the courts got involved and uh, at the end of the day, New York City was directed to stop yeah. that type of behavior. Yeah. And, and, and the way because, it, because the, so many of the criticisms and the complaints were found to be legitimate. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and so the way that the stop and frisk developed up in New York City was that they have what's called ComStat. Mm. And so they measure different things at, at the different precincts. All the district, all the commanders come in and they, and they measure different things. And one of the things they began to measure was how many people were stopped. Mm -hmm. So the commanders took it on their own to stop more people. And so it was, it, there was some indiscriminate, unconstitutional stops that were occurring in New York City. Mm -hmm. We've never had a, a policy or a program here like that in the District of Columbia. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the times that the Metropolitan Police Department makes stops in our community is based off of lookouts that we receive from the community after a crime has con occurred. So if you were the victim of, of a crime, God forbid, mm -hmm. uh, and you saw the person who, who let's say they assaulted you and they yeah. ran away, yeah. you call the police and you give a description of that person to the police mm -hmm. and then we make a stop. If we make a stop in that circumstance, mm -hmm. we're required to document that. So, th so that's the documentation uh, that the council member is talking about. Mm -hmm. um, they, the, the NEAR Act requires some more specific questions to be answered during the course of that stop. And not only that those questions be asked, but that they be documented. Mm -hmm. you know, so that it can be aggregated and people can look at that information, which from the very day that the NEAR Act uh, was passed, it was something that we have n no objection to. It's, mm -hmm. it's, there's no problem with having that information, sharing that information. I think it's important information uh, for people to have. Uh, one of the things that people who uh, are NEAR Act advocates do not tell you is that the first year of the NEAR Act, it was not funded by the council. Uh, explain, what is the NEAR Act? Uh, it's the Neighborhood en uh, Engagement Achieves Results Act. And okay. it's a series of about 21 or so different things mm -hmm. uh, that the city is to do mm -hmm. uh, to, to uh, make our city safer, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, measure, it's a measuring stick. It's a measuring, measuring stick. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things in the NEAR Act is, is a data collection by the police department. It's mm -hmm. one of many. Mm -hmm. The city has accomplished, I think, every other requirement of the NEAR Act mm -hmm. uh, since it has been passed. Uh, w what we did in the fall of this past year is we actually changed our policy on the police department. So we were asking the questions that are required of the NEAR Act when we conduct stops mm -hmm. and we're capturing it on our body worn camera mm -hmm. because it's, it's going, it took us a period of time to get our computer systems to the place where we can gather this. If, if you think about it, to get this information, we have to change our, com our IT systems. Mm -hmm. Like for, I'll give you an example. If you're <laughs> writing a, a, a ticket during a traffic stop, right. you're, you, you, you actually write information down on the ticket, but the questions that needed to be asked in the NEAR Act were not encompassed on that ticket. So mm -hmm. we have to change that form. Mm -hmm. We have to change the IT systems that c collect that data. Mm -hmm. And then the IT systems need to be able to aggregate, which means to say, mm -hmm. you know, out of these 50 stops, how many of these folks, uh, you know, were stopped for this reason? Or yes. whatever the question may be is, is the aggregation of mm -hmm. the data. So we're in the process of changing our IT systems. It should be done this summer. It's been a pretty comprehensive uh, undertaking for us and there is some costs associated with that but in the meantime we wanted to make sure that we were collecting the data on our body worn cameras so mm -hmm. we could be in compliance with the requirements of the NEAR Act. So that's the state of affairs right now. Mm -hmm. um, the data collection piece should be uh, accomplished before the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned body cameras. Uh -huh. So it seems as if it's universally accepted now that that has become a good thing. That that is something that gives an opportunity to take away hearsay, he said, she said, we've got it on video. As a, as a police chief of the nation's capital, where are you on that? You, so you, w with any piece of uh, technology, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's imperfect. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about a, a camera that's, you know, here yeah. on, on your chest and you move in a particular direction, it may not capture everything. Uh, we actually uh, very thoughtfully did a study here at MPD mm -hmm. about the uh, effects of the body-worn camera on policing. We mm -hmm. looked at four different categories. Uh, whether it had an impact on use of force, citizens' complaints, uh, judicial outcomes, mm -hmm. uh, and one other thing that escapes my memory. But 
uh, at the end of the study, and so the way we, we, it was a randomized control study, the way that we implemented it is uh, when we rolled out the cameras, half the officers had cameras, mm -hmm. half the officers didn't, and they compared the two groups mm -hmm. to see if there was these impacts. At the end of the study, it showed that, at least in those four categories that we looked at, that there was no significant impact in officer behavior based on the camera. So it's important for folks to know that at least in Washington, D.C., the cameras didn't impact officer behavior. The value in the camera, in my opinion, is that you do have a record when somebody wants to, um, uh, somebody has an a, a inappropriate or, or not a positive experience with the police. We have mm -hmm. a record of that. We can go back and we can look at that. Mm -hmm. So the Office of Police Complaints, <coughs> which is an independent agency in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. that investigates police complaints, mm -hmm. they have access to all of our body-worn camera. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has a problem with the police, mm -hmm. they can go to the Office of Police Complaints. They don't have to come to us. Uh -huh. They can pull up the video and they can say, you're right, the cop did the wrong thing, and then they can send discipline over to us to make sure that the officer is, is appropriately disciplined. And I I think yeah. as a, uh, you know, f for, for the community to have that, I think is, is extremely important. For the community? Yes. To have that access to an independent agency? An independent agency plus an independent record of mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. So say, for example, you didn't have a body-worn camera. Yeah. Some police officer acts like a jerk when he, he has you on a traffic stop. Mm -hmm. He just treats you sure. horrendously. Right. You make that complaint, but there's no record mm -hmm. of it. Now you have that as a citizen. You can say, oh, well, not, now we got the body-worn camera. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and on, our, on our side, uh, on the police department side, if you have a police officer acting inappropriately, it's the same thing. We can, we can say definitively they did that mm -hmm. and hold them accountable for the behavior. So something, whenever you get to talk about, get into the weeds of talking about policing, there is that again, sort of that four-letter word, blue code of silence. So right now we're talking about, you know, sort of the camera creates a sense of accountability. It would, it would seem that there is value there. Now you say between the ones who would and between the ones who didn't, there wasn't, there wasn't anything you thought was d discernible. The study didn't show that, right? Difference, yeah. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, w you know, what do you... How do you, um, I started off by talking about the, the blue code of silence. So what has been your history with police officers? Say, okay, you got a bad police officer. How much and how often has a bad police officer been reported by a good police officer? So we have a requirement, actually, in our, in our general orders, I don't know if you know this or not, that if you uh, witness a police officer who's involved in inappropriate conduct, mm -hmm. uh, that you have a requirement that you report it. And if you don't, you can be held accountable for their behavior mm -hmm. by not reporting it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's an a important rule. 30 years of policing, uh, I have seen you know, a day at the Metropolitan Police Department where officers wouldn't report others officers for bad behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, that has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of different reasons for that. It's not just the body-worn cameras. Uh, I truly believe, and it's, it's really trying to change a culture, that we're trying to instill in our police officers that bad police officers make us all look bad. Mm -hmm. And we don't want them to be police officers. And, and you know, I could, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit restricted in talking about specific examples, but spe specific exam examples come to my mind mm. uh, where we have had police officers that were involved in bad behavior where I talk to officers uh, in the field and they're like, I'm so, so glad you fired that guy. Mm. You know what I mean? So it, that, that has changed dramatically in policing, mm. uh, at least here in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, please talk to us about so the, the, the public, obviously, part of your first responsibility is public safety. And so some of the new technology, the facial identification, drones, and the rest. Talk to us, you know, about what MPD is doing to uh, deploy those things in an effort to make the city overall safer. So, so you know, uh, the facial recognition piece, uh, 
can can be helpful if you're trying to identify a, you know a violent offender. Um, one of the things that is uh, been, in my opinion, the most important um, technological advance uh, for policing in recent years has been the videos that we have out here. Mm -hmm. So the mayor has implemented a uh, rebate program mm. so people can get a rebate if they buy a camera for their home and you can get uh -huh. one of these ring cameras. Yeah. I can't tell you how many cases we've been able to close because of uh -huh. these ring cameras. So I th want to say so far they've given out like 10,000 uh, cameras in the city. Uh -huh. uh, if we could give out, you know, 100,000 more, it would make my job a lot easier. Uh -huh. uh, so the 10,000 cameras you're talking about are maybe up on the side of a building, on a they're, they're light pole? They're, they're on somebody's door, somebody's yeah. front door, mm -hmm. or somebody's driveway. Uh -huh. uh, and a lot of times when they have them on their front door, they actually capture the sidewalk in front of the home. Right. And so I can't tell you, like I said, how many times, and, and these are cases, I mean, these are cases that are heartbreaking. Um, where young people have lost their lives and where these cameras have been invaluable yeah. in us finding the person that's responsible. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, a little bit earlier about the safety. We, we were talking about, um, uh, well, let's, let's just go here. Motorist versus pedestrian. And you got to, you know, include bikers in there. Man, there is a lot of um, controversy about just those issues. So if you would share with us sort of your approach and what it is from a policy point of view, how you try to keep the, the motorists being able to get from point A to point B in a timely manner at the same time that pedestrians want to have their right of way and bikers want to have theirs. So, I, I mean, I think that, you know, we are in a city that is growing uh, pretty dramatically. We, to the tune of about 100,000 uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, we have more cars out, out on our streets. Uh, you know all the challenges in recent years that we've had with Metro, so more people are choosing uh, to drive yeah. uh, than take the Metro than they, than they ever were. Yeah. Uh, hopefully that's going to change. And it looks I like it's, I think, is, I think it's gonna flip back. I think That's unfortunate. Yeah, I think Metro's gonna, gonna it seems like they're moving in the right direction. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that's the case. Um, but, and then you add to that mix all those vehicles that we have on city streets, and you add to that mix pedestrians, and you add bicyclists. And mm -hmm. so the bicyclists uh, are really, tr they're critically important to reducing some of the car volume mm -hmm. we have on our street. Yeah. Um, and then getting the two groups uh, to kind of agree with what the safest way is to have this happen with nobody getting hurt. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we have had uh, traffic fatalities involving, and we've had some high profile ones recently. Uh, the one at 16th and B Street, a yeah. uh, pedestrian uh, lost his life. Uh, we had one uh, in the 1200 block of Florida where somebody lost it. And these, these are just, it, I, th I want to say that was a bicyclist, uh, an advocate here in the city that was known to anybody. Uh, it, he was kind of like a Rock Newman. Everybody knew the guy. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you see those kinds of things, and, and the one of the, you know, it's wh horribly tragic, but it really seems to have inspired a movement for, for change to make sure that our pedestrians and our cyclists are safe. You know, our role on the police department uh, is for moving infractions, mm -hmm. is to make sure that we're doing sufficient enforcement to try to change behavior. Mm -hmm. So we have our automated traffic enforcement program, and we've, we've all probably gotten a ticket from you know, the, the red light cameras and the speed cameras, but also having uh, police officers out there, particularly addressing uh, speed and distracted driving, I feel that, that that's our responsibility as an agency. And we've, mm -hmm. we've done a really good job recently stepping up our game to make sure that there's more enforcement in those areas. The, you know, the one little flip side to that is um, nobody likes getting a ticket. Yeah. So yeah. you, when you're trying to improve your relationship with the with the community, <laughs> <laughs> writing tickets right. is not a good way to do that. <laughs> right. um, one of the ways to improve the relationship with the community is again keep them safe. Here's what I want to ask you: Can you share with the our viewing audience sort of your role as chief of, of Metropolitan Police Department, with so many other police departments from Secret Service to Capitol Police? to so many other police departments here in this one municipality, you know, is that a blessing and a headache for you? Um, that's, that's one thing. Yeah. And, and once you 
answer that. I want to talk to you about some concerns that I hear from time to time, people coming down to the, see the Capitals play or the Nationals play or whatever, where people are in a, a lot of people are in a small place. And how do you prevent tragedy, major tragedy? So that's it's two, two real uh, difficult questions. <laughs> the, fir the first one, and the reason I smiled, because we just saw Kathy Lanier. Uh, when Kathy was the chief, uh, she, uh, the, the relationship really actually began to change with, with the federal agencies. Probably mm -hmm. when she first became chief, we didn't have a great relationship uh, with the federal agencies. And that has recently has become much better. So mm -hmm. in the last 10 years, that relationship has been, become very good. So I know the leadership at all of the, the federal agencies here in the city, and y you hit the nail on the head. We have a, a bunch of cops that are up there on Capitol Hill. We have Park Police, you have yeah. the Metropolitan yeah. Police Department, yeah. you have Secret Service, DEA, FBI, yeah. and yeah. they all have uniform patrols. <laughs> right. But but the relationship, at least at the leadership level, is, is really, really good. So so just rest assured, and one of the reasons it, uh, it has become better is you know, we do this inauguration thing every uh -huh. four years. Uh -huh. And when we do that inauguration, we have to seamlessly put into a place a pretty significant plan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're going to go in there as enemies, you're never going to get anything accomplished. So I think over the years, all these police departments decided it's better to be friends than enemies. And, and the relationship has, has gotten better from there. Uh, with regarding uh, handling the large events that we have in our city, and this goes to police staffing, um, you know, if you think back to 2018, you want to talk about large events. We had the uh, March for Our Lives yeah. uh, early in the year, which was all the young kids that came down right. uh, after the shooting in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, we had five championship hockey games, including a championship parade mm -hmm. for our Washington Capitals. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the Major League Baseball All-Star Game yeah. here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. We had the funeral for President George Bush. Right. Those are huge events yeah. that draw huge numbers of people. And if you don't think uh, you need a, a police department um, that can handle those events, in addition to making sure that our communities are safe, yeah. um, I think you, you, you might want to think twice you about reducing the size of the police department. I want to <laughs> ask you just on a very human level, that march where the kids were coming, Tens of thousands. As the police chief charged with the responsibility of keeping everybody safe, man, are you getting butterflies? I mean, it's... Uh, there's, there's two things, you know, there's two times that, I, I, there's a lot of times I don't sleep, but two, two times I can guarantee I won't sleep uh, is when we have those large events here in the city. And there, there's, you know, you want to make sure that everybody comes here and they're mm -hmm. safe. The other thing that you worry about as a chief of police is having any one of your police officers uh, hurt or killed yeah. uh, in the line of duty. As you know, this is police week this week. I'm going to tell you a little story. You know, I talked about the town I grew up in, Massachusetts. Yeah. Uh, a police officer was shot and killed uh, in Weymouth, Massachusetts this past year, a guy by the name of Michael Chesna. Mm. Uh, his wife, his two children, and his parents came down to the candlelight vigil that we had the other night on the National Mall. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to meet them because they were actually, they knew a close friend of mine from when I was a, a kid. Uh, and so we arranged to meet with them. Uh, when I met with her, uh, I gave her a hug. Uh, she didn't let go. Uh, and you know, what that really kind of struck home to me is the impact uh, that the losing a life unnecessarily can have on a family. Mm -hmm. uh, and I attribute it to our, our police officers who lost their lives in the line of duty, but I also attribute it to the 160 people we lost in our city last year. Yeah. You know, every one of those families, I'm sure if I was able to hug every one of them would have given me the same exact hug. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you talk about stuff that inspires you to continue to do this job. Um, th that is one of them. To know that Michael Chesna was willing uh, to put his life on the line uh, to make sure that other people were safe uh, is one of the things that inspires me to come in and, and worry about things like large events like you talked about and not sleep sometimes and you know from time to time get beat up all of that is okay uh, when you get a hug like that from a woman who lost her husband in the line of duty. Yeah. You know what we have 90 seconds uh, left this <laughs> hour went by very uh, very quickly 
What, uh, give you an opportunity with that time left to speak to what is, what do you see as has been the greatest success and joy of you taking over the reins of the uh, DC's I have, uh, police uh, department? I have, I've been, been asked that before and really one of the things, and it, I'm gonna go a lot further back than um, just being the chief, but one of the things I'm really, really proud about about this police department, and it, it's been a team effort, is the way that we have changed. When I joined the police department, you know, it was, at times it was embarrassing mm -hmm. uh, to come here. You know, we were very underfunded. Yeah. Uh, we had a really bad reputation for using excessive force. Uh, we had the dirty dozen, as you remember, that were getting arrested. So we had police officers that got getting arrested on a regular basis for some pretty serious offenses. That was, it was a, sometimes it was hard to come to work. But this department has transitioned in a very positive way. You have a really, really good police department here in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's been a team effort. I feel like I've played a role uh, in changing this police department. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really to be able to look back uh, on 30 years of work and feel like you did something that was worthwhile. I know we're not perfect, but our, our goal is to be perfect, and we've made a lot of uh, steps uh, in that direction. Continued success. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me. Thanks for coming yep. in. Folks, that wraps us for this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to WHUT.org. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye, and may God bless you. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.